So again, welcome everyone uh, to this 2021 CDC STI treatment guidelines update. Really happy to be here with you all. I'm hoping that more people do join us, but because it's, uh, it's let's see, it's 10.01 island time and four, it's almost 10.02 island time, we are gonna get started and I'm really hoping that more people do join us. Uh, so my name is Dr. Sharon Adler. I'm going to be doing brief introductions, and I'm going to be one of the presenters today, along with the fabulous Dr. Kelly Johnson, and I will uh, provide more details about myself and Dr. Johnson in a moment, but first I'm going to provide a little bit of information about the CAPTC. Um, so the CAPTC is one of the CDC-funded STD training centers. We're part of a national network of STD clinical prevention training centers. We're a multidisciplinary training and capacity building assistance center. Uh, there are eight of these nationwide. Uh, the California Prevention Training Center serves California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and Hawaii. Uh, in terms of disclosures for myself, for uh, Dr. Johnson and all of the planners, uh, there are no financial disclosures that we have to release, reveal. Uh, and in terms of CME, uh, this CME, this course, you can get CME for this course. Uh, we obtained CME through the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine. And if you attend this full course, uh, you will be able to get 1.5 credits. And on this next slide, there's a lot more details about the CME requirements. So um, first you need to be registered for the course on the, the NNPTC site. And we know there may be, mul be multiple people listening at one site. So if you have not registered, Please, if you're watching as a group, can you put your name and information into the chat? So um, Elizabeth Olson, who is our clinical coordinator, she can uh, write down your name so you would be able to get CME if you were desiring CME. So again, please put your name into the chat if there's a group of you watching at one screen and you haven't already registered for the course. In order for you to receive CME, uh, you must watch the entire webinar. Uh, you can't unfortunately get CME if you're viewing the webinar recording. And your attendance is going to be noted as you sign in. And then be aware that you will receive a post-course evaluation that should, should come to you by December 17th. Um, and this is going to come from the email that's training at nnptc.org within 24 hours after the webinar has ended. In terms of processing for CME, um, our processing is through the University of Nevada School of Medicine in Reno. And no, it, there, it can take some time for you to get your CME. So it, it takes approximately four to six weeks for stuff to process. Uh, so after you've, you uh, respond to this post-course evaluation, note that it may take four to six weeks for you to get notification that you can actually get your certificate. Um, and you will receive an email notification from CAPTC at ucsf.edu with a link to claim your certificate. Uh, and so make sure again that, uh, your, you have added this email to your inbox. So, and you can also check your spam and junk folders. We often get the question after we give a webinar, you know, are we gonna get co copies of this slide? What other resources are there? So just so that you all are aware, after the webinar, you are gonna get um, a whole host of materials within approximately two weeks. Uh, you're gonna get a copy of the presentation with access to the slides, a link to the webinar recording and any other available course materials. You don't have to request these. They will come from us, from the CAPTC at ucsf.edu. And I'm noticing there's a lot going on in the chat. Let me just take a quick, oh great, quick peek. There's hellos from various teams. Hello from Palau. Hello from CNMI, that's great. Hello from Guam. Okay, wonderful. We've got people from various islands. So great to see. Um, Okay, a couple um, important uh, Zoom tools for this webinar. So the beginning of this webinar is gonna be didactic. So myself, I'm gonna be speaking along with Dr. Kelly Johnson. You are all already muted. Um, and so it's great, you guys have been using the chat. Uh, you can use the chat if you have any technical questions. Uh, and the chat box is gonna be open throughout the webinar for questions. But then at the end, we're, all, we're also going to give you the capacity to unmute because this is a somewhat small group. You'll be able to unmute and you can ask clinical questions live to myself and uh, Dr. Johnson. Um, so just know that um, you'll have the capacity to do that. 
towards the end of this webinar. If there are any questions about the technical issues during the webinar, you can contact Elizabeth Olson if there's questions about CME. This is Elizabeth's email at the bottom. Uh, you can chat her directly right now um, during the webinar because she is on live with us. So if you have any questions about CME right now, you can reach her through the chat. All right. So that was kind of the int introductory comments. And now I'm gonna launch into the content of this webinar and also just provide a little bit more detail about myself and Dr. Kelly Johnson. So um, my name is Dr. Sharon Adler and I'm clinical faculty at the California Prevention Training Center. I am also an assistant clinical professor at the University of California, San Francisco in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. Um, and I've been in the field of STDs for about 20 years. And I actually realized that um, around 20 years ago in 20, 2001, I had the great honor of traveling to the Pacific region. Um, and so I may have met some of you in person back in 2001, if you were with me doing this work back in 2001. Um, and I am board certified in preventive medicine and public health. Uh, Dr. Kelly Johnson, who is going to be joining me, we're going to be tag teaming the content for this uh, presentation. Uh, she is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of California, San Francisco. She is also a public health medical officer in the STD control branch at the California Department of Public Health. And she works along with me at the as a clinical faculty member at the CAPTC. And she is fabulous and has lots of experience with HIV as well. So um, a couple important resources. First is the STD CCN. This is a web based clinical consult service. So for everyone nationwide and, and in the US Pacific um, uh, jurisdictions, if you have a clinical question, a really complex syphilis case that you want a consultation on with an STD expert, you can use, you can go to this website, stdccn.org, put in a request to put a consult in, and that will come to um, one of us at the training center and we will respond to you uh, within one to five business days, depending on the urgency of that consult. It's a really fabulous service. It's been going on for many years now um, and it's funded by the CDC. Another really wonderful resource I wanna mention before we delve into content is the National STD Curriculum. Uh, this is uh, funded by the CDC and hosted at one of our sister training sites, the University of Washington. STD Training Center, uh, and it has just been updated with the 2021 STI treatment guidelines. Uh, and so there are self-study lessons, there's a whole host of questions, um, there are podcasts on there, and you can get free CME through this site. So it's just a wonderful STD, STI related resource for you to be aware of. Okay, so now, and I think we've got 26 participants, but it looks like there's multiple people at some of these computers, so that's fabulous. I'm gonna launch in now into the content. And so the goals of this webinar are to share with you all some of the updates in the 2021 STI treatment guidelines, provide some of the rationale behind some of these updates, and then to provide some guidance and best practices on how to align your clinical practice with these updated guidelines. So they're somewhat hot off the presses. They were released in July of 2021 um, and just as an FYI, expected later in 2021, but now we're kind of getting to the end of 2021. It might be early 2022. We are expecting from the CDC uh, an update in um, the pre-exposure prophylaxis guidance for the prevention of HIV as well. And if you're kind of paying attention here, prior guidelines, the language was STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, which is referring to a disease state. And those have shifted now in 2021 to SDIs. Uh, and so this is kind of a broader term, uh, which refers more specifically to the pathogen, and it includes asymptomatic disease. And I know that these terms are used interchangeably. So STIs and STDs, you know, they can be used interchangeably, but the STI term is a little bit more expansive. And so the CDC has opted with the new guidelines in 2021 to change the name to STIs. A bit on the background of how these guidelines were developed. Um, so these truly are evidence-based guidelines and they're evidence-based on four principal outcomes of STI therapy. So we're looking for eradication of the etiologic agent, uh, uh, pre prevention, I mean, re reduction in signs and symptoms, prevention of sequelae and prevention of transmission. And so when we're looking at the recommended regimens, they truly are preferred over the alternatives on one of all of these um, principal outcomes. 
And then when you're looking at the list of treatments, treatments are alphabetized unless really there is a priority of choice for one of these outcomes. Uh, and so that's why recommended is preferred over or alternative and again, as I said, these were released in July of 2021. Um, in the middle of the slide, there's a link to the full guidelines. Um, and we, there actually is an app for the guidelines. Uh, the, the app, I believe, has not been fully updated, um, but there is an interim app that you can uh, download if you're someone who uses apps. And then one more slide um, on kind of the, uh, how these guidelines were developed. The CTC convenes a meeting, and this meeting took place actually in June of 2019 in Atlanta. And prior to that meeting, it's a three-day meeting. Prior to that meeting, um, CDC sends out to subject matter, matter experts throughout, throughout the country. Uh, and these experts go through the literature, compile background papers, compile tables of evidence, and there's a whole systematic review of the evidence. And people convene at this meeting to kind of look at the evidence um, and answer some of these key questions. In addition, they're rating the quality of the evidence as they uh, relates to the US Preventive Services Task Force evidence in terms of screening recommendations. Um, and then the guidelines are drafted. Uh, and so then you can see there was a gap in time. The guidelines meeting was in June of 2019. Um, and then it wasn't until July of 2021 when the guidelines were released. And we all know why that gap took place because we've all been dealing with COVID. Um, so things were kind of delayed somewhat, uh, but really happy to say that we, the guidelines were released in July of 2021. And now we're moving forward with this new guidance. Okay, and now I'm gonna shift actually into the content of the guidance. And I'm gonna start with screening recommendations. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so before we actually move into screening, uh, important that we all recall that uh, in order to do an STI screening, we really first have to take a sexual history or sexual health assessment. This is a key component of sexual health care. Um, and so what's highlighted on this slide in yellow are changes in the 2021 treatment guidelines. I mean, that's gonna be consistent throughout this presentation. All of the content that is highlighted in yellow is new content. Um, and so um, for consistently for many years, we've used uh, an analogy of the five Ps being useful to take a sexual history. And the five Ps are partners, practices, protection from STIs, past history of STIs and pregnancy. Um, and the updates are that in the partners section, previously uh, the language was, are your partners male, female, or both? That was what was recommended. And the CDC has moved to a more gender neutral language. And so what is recommended is asking, what are the genders of your partners uh, when we're inquiring about sexual partners? The other thing that is new is that um, as it relates to pregnancy, in the past, the guidance was to ask about what are you doing to prevent pregnancy? And the new guidance is, or what are your intentions around pregnancy? It's a bit broader. Um, so those are the updates. And then the other thing that's at the bottom of the slide is a, is a sixth P, and that's pleasure. And that is put in by the PTCs. This is not in the CDC guidelines. Um, it's kind of an aspirational goal for all of us to realize that people in general engage in sex and there is pleasure associated with it. Um, and so we might wanna inquire and make sure that there's, if there are any issues in this arena that would um, cause for further conversation. Uh, this slide just reviews kind of the utility of a sexual health assessment and why it's so important. Uh, so we want to inquire about a person's sexual health in terms of their risk behaviors to try and diagnose and treat a symptomatic disease. So if symptoms are reported when we're doing our sexual health assessment, then it would guide us on our exam. In addition, it guides us um, on what screening we should we should we should take, we should um, ascertain in these patients. So if someone reports that they're engaging in receptive anal intercourse, we're going to want to screen them, for example, with for gonorrhea and chlamydia at that site. And if we screen them, and then we may be able to detect asymptomatic disease that then can prevent spread to new sexual partners. Sexual health assessment is also really important in that with screening, we were able to prevent serious sequelae. For example, screening for chlamydia has been shown to prevent things like infertility. And it's also just a segue to risk reduction conversations with our patients. All right, now we're getting into the meat of this and we're gonna talk about the changes in terms of screening in the guidelines, the 2021 STI treatment guidelines. Again, all of the content in yellow is what's, highlight, what's, what's new, but I will review some of the, some of the think content that hasn't unchanged just so that we're all on the same page with what the current guidance is. So screening for non-pregnant cis women, and this is regardless of the gender, so genders if they're male or female, for all women under the age of 25, you want to screen at least once annually for chlamydia and gonorrhea, and then HIV at least once. 
Um, and what's new is um, hepatitis C screening is now newly recommended for women, women under the age of 25 and also women 25 years of age and, and older. Um, and you wanna screen all these women for hep C at least once if they're 18 years of age or older, unless it's known that the prevalence of hep C is very, very low in, within your community. And when we look at this slide and all the next screening slides, you're gonna see there's a theme. And the, one of the main themes is that hepatitis C screening has been added. For women over the age of 25, um, you wanna screen for chlamydia and gonorrhea if there's risk. And some of the risk factors that CDC lists are new partner, sex with more than one partner, sex partner that has concurrent partners, a sex partner that has an STI or transactional sex. So someone who's exchanging sex for money, sex for drugs. Um, women over the age of 25 um, should be screened for HIV at least once. And then again, similarly, hep C, unless the prevalence of hep C is very, very low. Moving on now to screening for pregnant women. Um, the things that have been changed are the ones that are highlighted in yellow, but just to review, uh, we wanna screen all pregnant women for HIV at the first prenatal visit. And then you wanna retest during the third trimester by 36 weeks if there are risks for HIV. In terms of syphilis screening, um, a couple changes here. I'm actually gonna defer talking about this until I move to the syphilis section, because I'm gonna go into more detail. Um, the CDC included more detail on syphilis screening and how you're gonna retest during the third trimester. Um, and there's specific risk factors that have been identified. And I will discuss those uh, when I discuss syphilis. Um, other screening in pregnancy for cis women um, would be hepatitis B screening. Um, and this hasn't changed. And you wanna screen even if someone's been vaccinated before or previously tested. And what's new in 2021 is hep C screening. So going along with that theme, and you wanna screen with every pregnancy. In women that are under the age of 25 um, or have some of those risk factors that I talked about previously, you wanna screen for chlamydia and gonorrhea at the first prenatal visit plus retest in the third trimester. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, moving on now to screening um, among cis men who have sex with men. Again, uh, content that is in yellow are the updates for 2021, but I'll review kind of the consistent guidance that's been with CDC for many years. And that is among these men, we want to screen for HIV, syphilis, urethral gonorrhea, and chlamydia, rectal gonorrhea, and chlamydia. And this is where sexual history taking is so important. So if a person reports receptive anal sex, those are the people that you want to screen at the, at the rectal area. And then you want to screen for pharyngeal gonorrhea if the person's engaging in oral sex. Hepatitis B screening is also recommended for men who have sex with men. And then what's new is hep C screening. And this again is at least once if the person is over the age of 18, unless there's a known prevalence within the community that's very, very low. Another update for um, men who have sex with men is anal cancer screening. And that the recommendation that's new is you wanna do an annual digital anal rectal exam um, that, because this may be useful to detect early changes of anal cancer. One thing that I didn't mention, I'm just gonna highlight down at the bottom is the screening for HIV, syphilis, urethral gonorrhea and chlamydia, rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia and pharyngeal gonorrhea is at least annually, but possibly more frequently, possibly every three to six months, if the person is engaging in um, more risky sex, which would include multiple or anonymous partners, drug use or in partners with known risk. Okay, uh, other updates in the screening section uh, involve transgender persons. <coughs> And I, I apologize, I have a cold. And so you're gonna hear me coughing every once in a while. So in terms of transgender persons, there's actually a whole new section on, on transgender persons that's been included that's new in 2021. And the take home guidance here is that you wanna screen based on the person's current anatomy and the gender of their sex partners. And so we would offer HIV screening to all transgender persons and be aware that uh, transgender persons who are living with HIV if they're having sex with cisgender men, they're at similar risk for STIs as cis MSM. In terms of an anatomy, um, transgender women, who if they've had a vaginoplasty, um, then you wanna screen um, at all of the sites. So you wanna screen for gonorrhea and chlamydia at all the sites based on whether they have had a vaginoplasty or not. Um, and then similarly for transgender men, if they've had a metoidioplasty, um, even if they've had that, if they still have vagina that's present, you would want to screen for an STI and use an appropriate cervical or vaginal swab if they still have vaginal tissue that's there post their metoidioplasty. 
All right, I think we're getting to the end of screening here and there's one more slide on screening among adolescents. Um, and the changes here are primarily for young females. And so we definitely wanna screen young females for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Um, and you wanna screen, screen at genital sites. Uh, but what is shifted now is that um, there's a new consider recommendation to kind of do a shared, shared uh, decision-making with these young females about whether you might wanna screen them at the rectum for gonorrhea and chlamydia and at the pharynx for gonorrhea, just based on data that have been reeling, revealing that young females can have these infections at multiple sites. In terms of young men who only have female partners, um, there really aren't guidance to screen these young men that are heterosexual, they only have female partners, and it's shared decision making and you might consider screening, um, particularly if you're uh, dealing with um, patients who are young men presenting at STD clinic settings, because these settings tend to have higher incidence, other settings that tend to have higher incidence are, are correctional settings. In terms of adolescents, we want to offer HIV testing to all adolescents, um, and then trick screening. Uh, basically, you're going to consider the local prevalence when deciding whether to screen HIV infected or persons living with HIV. If they're young adolescents, they would be recommended to have TVAG screening. And I'm actually going to be talking about trick screening towards the end of my presentation. And then another thing to highlight is that we want to screen young men who have sex with men and pregnant females for syphilis. Okay, I'm done with my content and I'm going to stop sharing my slides because we're going to now have um, Dr. Kelly Johnson take over. And I'm going to pass it to you, Kelly. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Adler. And thank you especially to all of you for being here. I am just going to take one second to pull up my slides. Give us just a second to transition. Perfect. So I have the pleasure of starting with a case. And we are going to ask you guys to vote via poll. So here you have a 20 year old male presenting with three days of urethral discharge and you can see from that picture on the right hand side of this slide what that discharge looks like. This patient is sexually active has multiple male and female sexual partners. The gram stain of his discharge shows numerous gram negative intracellular diplococci which you can see on the lower right hand side of this slide kind of these intracellular bacteria and this is consistent with a diagnosis of course of gonorrhea. He has a urine nucleic amplification test sent and it's positive for both chlamydia and gonorrhea. So I see you guys are already voting. We have about 9% of people voting so far, but how would you treat this patient? Ceftriaxone at 250 IM plus azithromycin times one. Ceftriaxone at 250 IM plus doxycycline for a week. Or ceftriaxone at a different dose, 500 IM plus doxycycline for a week. Okay, it looks like our participation is leveling off. We're at, ooh, we're at 60 some percent now. Ooh, almost 70%. Okay, you can go ahead and close that poll. Let's see, we're over 70% participants. Okay, so we have the, the biggest number of people picking option C, but we're sort of mixed. We still have a good number of people picking both options A and B. So let's talk about it. I will tell you, the correct answer is the ceftriaxone at 500 plus the doxycycline BID orally for a week. But let's spend some time kind of talking about why that is and what the data is supporting this, because some of this, of course, is a change from before. So we'll start talking about chlamydia. There has been a question with chlamydia about whether doxycycline or azithromycin is better for quite some time. This slide shows some of the observational data for urogenital chlamydia specifically. And just to orient you, this is observational studies on the x-axis, and then treatment efficacy is what you're seeing on the y-axis. Doxycycline is in the light purple, and azithromycin is in the darker purple. And you can kind of see that at urogenital sites, treatment efficacy looks pretty good for both doxycycline and azithromycin. But when these drugs are compared together, even at urogenital sites, the bars for doxycycline are a little bit higher than those for azithromycin. Okay, so what about if you look at rectal chlamydia specifically? So again, this is observational data, some of the earlier studies. But here, again, the studies are on the x-axis, the treatment efficacy on the y-axis, and here doxycycline in kind of this darker blue color, the treatment efficacy in observational studies actually looks quite a bit better than that for azithromycin, with doxy being like 
mid to high 90s and azithro more like 70s, 80s, maybe low 90s for its treatment efficacy. So this prompted the need for a randomized control trial. And there have actually been two of these now. I'm going to present one of them. This one was by Julie Dombrowski and colleagues published in CID this past year. And this is a randomized control trial looking at doxycycline versus azithromycin. Again, this is for rectal chlamydia specifically. And the outcome they were going for was microbiologic cure at the four week mark. And here you can see in a randomized control trial setting, doxycycline for rectal chlamydia was way more effective than azithromycin with doxy being 100% effective and azithro being only 74% effective. So with that data and for that reason, the guidelines have changed. So in 2021, if you're treating chlamydia at any site, urogenital, rectal, or pharyngeal, the recommended regimen in non-pregnant patients is now doxycycline given BID for seven days. Azithromycin is still an option, but it's now been demoted to an alternative regimen. In non-pregnant patients, the one gram of azithromycin is now an alternative regimen. And there's another alternative regimen too, which is levofloxacin at 500 milligrams for seven days, not used as commonly. But I'd say the major change is that emphasis on doxycycline for a week in non-pregnant patients, just to summarize. Okay, what about pregnant patients? So doxycycline is contraindicated in the second and third trimesters of pregnancy, especially. So if your patient's pregnant and they have chlamydia at any site, you're still going back to that old standby of azithromycin given one gram orally in a single dose. But in pregnancy specifically and exclusively, if they have chlamydia, a test of cure is recommended at the three to four week mark. The alternative regimen for chlamydia in pregnancy is amoxicillin, but it's given three times a day or TID for seven days. So harder to take more pills, longer days, um, not used as much. So that's chlamydia. And of course there were a lot of changes for chlamydia, but there's even more for gonorrhea. So we're gonna transition into gonorrhea next. Okay, let's talk about gonorrhea. For gonorrhea, really the story over the last several years has been increasing antibiotic resistance. So this slide is to show some data about gonorrhea antibiotic resistance, and it's compar comparing isolates from 2009 to isolates from 2019. And this data was presented at the 2020 STD Prevention Conference. And what I really wanna draw your attention to is just this purple, uh, purple, excuse me, this green slice of this pie. <laughs> so in 20, 2009, the green slice of this pie was really big. And the green slice of the pie recommends, uh, excuse me, represents gonorrhea isolates that were susceptible to all the antibiotics against which they were tested. Meaning those isolates of gonorrhea did not have any antibiotic resistance. So that was 2009. And then if you jump to 2019 and you just focus on that green slice of pie again, you'll see that only 45% of isolates, so less than half, were still susceptible to all those antibiotics. So just kind of a graphic representation of the fact that gonorrhea has experienced increasing antibiotic resistance over the last decade or so. And then if you wanna look at just azithromycin specifically in terms of gonorrhea resistance, I'll show this data here. This data shows on the x-axis you have years, on the y-axis you have percentage of gonorrhea isolates with decreased susceptibility to different antibiotics. And I really just wanna draw your attention to azithromycin, which is represented by the pink bars. And I really just want you to see that the pink bars have been rising over time, demonstrating that gonorrhea has developed resistance to azithromycin specifically over the last, again, decade or so. So let's say, what does that mean for the treatment guidelines? So of course, with that data, the 2021 gonorrhea treatment guidelines have changed. So for uncomplicated urogenital, rectal, or pharyngeal infections of gonorrhea, the recommended regimen is now ceftriaxone, and it's a higher dose than it used to be. It's 500 milligrams given IM times one. And that dose is for persons weighing less than 150 kilograms. If your patient weighs more than that, 150 kilograms or more, the dose changes again, and it should be one gram of IM ceftriaxone. The bottom line is that we're no longer recommending dual therapy with azithromycin, so just ceftriaxone monotherapy, and the dose is different than it used to be. Another change is that they're now recommending a test of cure in cases of pharyngeal gonorrhea only. 
That is because internationally, when there have been cases of gonorrhea treatment failure, that's typically occurred at the pharyngeal site. So to try to stay ahead of that trend, the CDC is recommending a test of cure, and they're saying seven to 14 days for pharyngeal gonorrhea. What we're sort of recommending for, for as an aside um, is, is leaning more on that 14 day side of things, because if you test, if, if you send your test of cure earlier than that, there's a chance that it'll be a false positive since you may be detecting some remaining genetic material from dead organisms essentially. And then the last point that I wanna make about this slide, just directing your attention to the right hand side is that if you're treating for gonorrhea, but you haven't excluded chlamydia and you want to treat for chlamydia, then if the, the person's not pregnant, you do want to add that doxycycline. And again, it's the same dose we talked about for seven days. Okay. What about alternative gonorrhea treatments? So for uncomplicated infections, again, cervix, urethra, rectum, what do you do if ceftriaxone is not available? So the guidelines now say if, if ceftriaxone is not available, the preferred alternative regimen is cefixime, which is an oral cephalosporin, and the dose is 800 milligrams given orally times one. Now, if this is only if your patient is not cephalosporin allergic. If your patient is cephalosporin allergic, they can't get ceftriaxone or cefixime, then your alternative regimen is still gentamicin given 240 milligrams IM plus one dose of azithromycin at two grams orally. And I should say, the guidelines now say that if your patient has pharyngeal gonorrhea and they cannot receive ceftriaxone, there are no reliable treatment alternatives. And what you should do for pharyngeal gonorrhea specifically is consult with an infectious diseases specialist. And again, just to make this point one more time, if you're worried about chlamydia, you haven't excluded chlamydia, add that doxycycline for seven days in a non-pregnant patient. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, we're gonna jump into case number two. This is a case of persistent urethritis. So this is a 40-year-old MSM presenting with persistent dysuria and urethral discharge. It looks exactly the same as before, but this is a different patient. This patient was seen two weeks ago and treated for urethritis, got perfect dosing ceftriaxone at 500 IM plus doxycycline for seven days, but he says the discharge never went away. And he says he really hasn't had any sex at all in the past two weeks. You look back at his prior results and it turns out his gonorrhea and chlamydia testing was actually negative from his prior visit. And thank you for launching the poll. I was going to say that, but I'd like you all to vote now about what is the most likely cause, do you think, of this patient's persistent urethritis? Is it gonorrhea? Is it chlamydia? Is it trichomonas? Or is it mycoplasma genitalium? I'm just giving it a minute for people to vote. We're about 22% of people participating right now. Last time we got all the way up to 70 some, so let's give it another second or two. Okay, looks like it's slowing down and you can go ahead and end the poll. Let's see our results. So far it's looking about like about half of you think it's mycoplasma genitalium. And then there's some people voting for trichomonas followed by gonorrhea and chlamydia. So nice spread. And I will say that the correct answer in a patient who is MSM is most likely to be mycoplasma genitalium. Now, if you've never heard of this organism, you're not alone. It's a relatively recent STI pathogen, but this year in 2021, for the first time, mycoplasma genitalium got its own section or its own chapter. So I would say it's no longer an emerging pathogen and it's one that you really want to know about. It turns out that more than one in four men with urethritis actually have mycoplasma genitalium. And there was actually a, a, an FDA approved nucleic amplification test approved in 2019 that can be sent on urine, urethral, penile meatal, endocervical, or vaginal specimens. At this point, population-based screening is not recommended, but what the CDC does recommend is that there are clinical scenarios in which you should think about testing for mycoplasma genitalium if you have access to that kind of test. And those clinical scenarios are basically 
like what I showed you, a persistent urethritis case if initial treatment fails. And similarly, for cases of persistent PID or cervicitis where patients aren't responding to treatment like you would expect. So how do you treat mycoplasma genitalium if you do find it? So the big takeaway is that mycoplasma genitalium is treated sequentially. You start with doxycycline and you treat with that 100 milligrams BID for a week. And the goal of that initial doxycycline treatment is to reduce the bacterial load. Then there are two separate recommended regimens, and it kind of depends on whether you have access to resistance testing. So if you do have resistance testing and the mycoplasma genitalium is macrolide resistant, or in the much more common scenario that you don't have access to resistance testing, the recommended regimen is again that doxycycline for seven days, and then you follow it with moxifloxacin, a fluoroquinolone, given at 400 milligrams for seven days. And actually that should be once a day for seven days. I apologize for that mistake. The moxie is once a day. Now, in cases where the, where the MGEM resistance testing is available, and this is rare, but if you have that and it turns out the isolate is macrolide sensitive, you can treat with that doxycycline for seven days, but then you can follow it up with azithromycin, and you can see what the dosing is on the sort of right-hand lower side of this slide. Again, that's a less common clinical scenario because for now at least, most places do not have access to resistance testing for mycoplasma, but I wanted you to be aware that there's a, there's a plan eventually for this to be sort of like resistance-guided therapy. Okay, now let's talk about a few syndromes and we're gonna go into the third case I'm gonna talk about. So you have a 29 year old female now with a history of prior gonorrhea. She's sexually active with one cis male partner, but she's unsure whether that partner has any other partners. She presents with lower abdominal pain and dyspareunia, meaning she has pain with sex. On exam, she's afebrile, but she has abdominal tenderness as well as some cervical motion tenderness. And you can see what her cervix looks like in that right hand top image on the slide. Her cervix is friable and she has a wet mount done showing numerous white blood cells. Gonorrhea and chlamydia testing is done and it's pending. So let's say you've diagnosed her with PID based on the, the tenderness in her exam and you wanna treat her as an outpatient. You think she's clinically stable, she can have outpatient treatment for PID. You can go ahead and open the next poll and I'll just read through some of the options briefly. Would you use ceftriaxone, doxycycline, and metronidazole with a ceftriaxone at 500 milligrams, option one? Would you use ceftriaxone at 250 plus doxycycline for 14 days without the metronidazole? Or option three, would you use ceftriaxone at 500 plus azithro times one with metronidazole for 14 days? Okay, we're at 60% of voting, 65% of voting, even better. Let's go ahead and close this poll. You guys are really on it. Yeah, so 75% of people picked Ceftrax on 500, Doxy 100 BID for 14 days, and Metronidazole for 14 days. Great job. I will show you that you have picked the correct answer. But let's talk about why that's the correct answer. So there's been this question about whether metronidazole should be used routinely for outpatient treatment of PID. And there has actually been a recent randomized control trial about this. This trial involved 233 cisgender women. They were treated with ceftriaxone. Now the dose was 250 back then because that was what the guidelines said, but so they got ceftriaxone at 250 plus doxycycline for 14 days, plus either metronidazole given at 500 BID for 14 days, or they got placebo at BID for 14 days. And the primary outcome they were looking for was clinical improvement at three days. But they also looked for some additional outcomes like anaerobic organisms in the endometrium at 30 days, like fever, or like reduction in CMT or cervical motion tenderness. And it turns out the clinical improvement at three days is actually quite similar between the two arms, but metronidazole showed some advantages by decreasing anaerobes in the endometrium, by decreasing mycoplasm mycoplasma genitalium in the cervix, and by reducing symptoms, again, like cervical motion tenderness or pelvic tenderness. 
So the conclusion from that was that metronidazole should be routinely added to the treatment that you're using for PID. So just to show you the regimen, so the recommendations are now in the 2021 guidelines, ceftriaxone at that 500 milligram dose, or you could use cefoxetin with probenicid, that's used less commonly, plus you can add doxycycline for 14 days at that same dosing with metronidazole given 500 BID for 14 days like we've been talking about. So bottom line, and you guys were already on this, metronidazole is now involved in the treatment of PID as an outpatient. Okay, this is the final slide for this section of my talk, but let's just go over a couple other syndromes. So we'll start at the top of this table. Let's talk about urethritis and cervicitis. Ideally, you're treating urethritis and cervicitis based on knowing the pathogen and targeting that pathogen. But if you don't know the pathogen and you're treating empirically, you definitely want to treat for chlamydia. So that doxycycline for seven days is preferred with azithromycin as an alternative option. Again, for urethritis and cervicitis, if you are in an area where you're in a high prevalence setting for gonorrhea or you think the patient is especially high risk for gonorrhea, then you add treatment for gonorrhea as well. And again, that's that ceftriaxone at 500 milligrams as your preferred choice. Okay, let's do proctitis. So for proctitis, you basically wanna treat for chlamydia and gonorrhea. So you wanna treat with ceftriaxone 500 plus doxycycline for seven days. But the sort of caveat or thing to know is that you, you want to extend that doxycycline to three weeks or 21 days, covering for lymphogranuloma venereum or LGV. If your patient has things like bloody discharge, perianal or mucosal ulcers, or they have tenesmus, all in the setting of a positive rectal chlamydia test. So just sort of a caveat there to think about LGV if your patient has rectal chlamydia and they have some concerning symptoms. And finally, epididymitis. Epididymitis treatment sort of depends on the clinical scenario and the pathogens that you know or suspect. So if gonorrhea and chlamydia are suspected, you treat for gonorrhea and chlamydia with the same drugs and the same doses that we've been talking about. If you've ruled out gonorrhea and chlamydia and you think the epididymitis is thus only due to enteric pathogens, then you can treat with levofloxacin given 500 milligrams daily as an oral drug for 10 days. Finally, if you're not sure and you think it could be gonorrhea, chlamydia, or enterics and you want to cover all of them, you can treat with a ceftriaxone 500 times 1 given IM plus that levofloxacin given at 500 milligrams for 10 days. Great. And with that, I am at my final slide for this section, so I will stop sharing and turn it back to you, Dr. Adler. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. And now I'm going to try and share my screen. Just one second. Okay. So, um, Dr. Johnson mentioned a uh, test of cure when she was talking about uh, pharyngeal gonorrhea, but let's just review some updates related to test of cure that are in the 2021 treatment guidelines. And so, um, what's again, what's highlighted in yellow is what's new. And so there's always a question, what's the difference between a test of cure versus retesting? Test of cure, we're really looking for treatment failure. Um, and it's done fairly soon after treatment. Um, and what's new is anyone who's been treated for uh, pharyngeal gonorrhea uh, would want to get a test of cure at two weeks. And so at this is, um, the CDC guidelines does say seven to 14 days, and we're kind of highlighting that the 14 day time period would be the one uh, to use because, for the reason that Dr. Johnson mentioned is that you don't want to get a false positive from um, gonorrhea that's actually not alive. And this is true for all patients, whatever regimen that they get. Uh, the other thing that is new is um, LGV. If an alternative regimen is used, you want to get a test of cure at four weeks. And so the standard treatment for LGV is using doxycycline, but if azithromycin is used instead, then you would get a test of cure. And then M genitalium, um, at three weeks, you'd want to get a test of cure if the regimen other than the moxycycline regimen was used. And so uh, it doesn't say here doxy plus moxicycline, that, but that's what would be, would be utilized. But if doxy plus azithromycin is used, uh, there's not as much data on that. And so CDC is wanting to get a test of cure. 
Uh, what hasn't changed has always been consistently for many years a recommendation in pregnant women uh, who have been treated for chlamydia to get a test of cure at four weeks. Um, and that's regardless of what regimen is used, just to make sure that we have adequately treated chlamydia early in a pregnant woman. In terms of retesting, uh, there are no updates in this arena, but I'll just review what the current retesting recommendations are. And so when we're doing a retest, we're actually looking for reinfection. We're not looking for treatment failure. We're looking for reinfection at a, at a time period out from their initial infection. And the thinking around this retest is that when we've identified someone who has an SDI, uh, there's data that demonstrates that many of these young men and women are at risk for reinfection, either from an untreated partner or just because they are in a sexual group that um, is at higher risk for STIs. So you want to retest for reinfection for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and then LGV is a chlamydia for all patients, no matter what regimen that they have been treated with. Ideally, you retest at three months, uh, but we know that sometimes people come back maybe a month later or they come back six months later. So any time really between that one to 12 month time period is fine. And this is all unchanged. And then similarly unchanged, um, but I'm just gonna mention is trichomonas retesting. And then you wanna do that in, in women, patients who have a vaginal infection and you would retest at three months. Uh, but again, any time in that one to 12 month window is fine. Okay, now I'm gonna shift and talk about genital ulcer disease, my favorite, syphilis, and then we'll talk a little bit about herpes. Uh, so in terms of syphilis, um, there are just a few updates in the treatment guidelines. Uh, one of the updates in terms of the content and the discussion around syphilis, uh, there's a little bit more detail and a recognition that not everybody presents with textbook syphilis. And so people can present with atypical manifestations, they can present with painful ulcers, they can present with multiple lesions. And so textbook would be a painless solitary ulcer, but there's a broader conversation and description of the fact that people can present with painful and multiple lesions. In addition, there's enhanced description about ocular and otic manifestations, and I'm gonna save discussion of that. So I've got a whole slide that goes over this. Uh, in terms of how we diagnose syphilis, uh, most places don't have access to direct testing, so it's through serologies. And the guidance just kind of highlights that you can use either the traditional or the reverse sequence algorithm. And so the traditional is where you start with a non-treponemal test, and then you confirm it with a treponemal test or you use a reverse algorithm where you start with one of the automated treponemal tests and then you uh, reflex back to a non-treponemal. And I'm just highlighting that I know that um, in many of the islands of the Pacific region, you're using the TP determined and I think you're using the SD bio line for the available treponemal tests. <coughs> So this slide just reviews syphilis staging. Just as a reminder, it's really important to stage. Staging influences treatment. So patients who present with symptoms, um, they get staged based on those symptoms. Patients who present with primary uh, manifestations, uh, like an ulcer, we get staged with having primary. Patients who present with rash, alopecia, mucus patches, um, um, or, uh, or lata in, the, in moist uh, general areas, they could have secondary syphilis. And then anyone who has neurologic signs or symptoms or otic, um, otic symptoms would be often um, tinnitus, which can be unilateral or bilateral um, and hearing loss, ocular manifestations. Um, these get, patients get staged as having neurosyphilis, otic syphilis, or ocular syphilis. And that staging is so important because they're gonna get different treatment. Patients who are being screened for syphilis and have no clinical manifestations, um, they get staged as having latent infection. And it's really important that a full exam is done on these patients to make sure that you don't miss a hidden ulcer or other signs of, of that's symptomatic syphilis. Um, and then latent syphilis um, is further uh, delineated into early latent, where we think people have been infected for less than one year. And there's specific criteria that are used that indicates that they've been infected or they meet that criteria. So anyone who um, now has a positive syphilis serology, but had a negative serology in the past year, anyone who's a known contact to an early case, someone who has good history of typical signs or symptoms, or someone who was previously treated, and now they have a sustained fourfold rise in titer. Um, these are indications that they've been infected for less than one year. And then the final, um, criteria is someone whose only exposure was within this year. Um, so they're newly sexually active. Any of these are yes, they can meet criteria for early latent disease and they get different treatment than someone who doesn't meet any of these criteria and gets staged as late latent infection. 
Uh, in terms of treatment, uh, actually there are no changes in the 2021 treatment guidelines. So no changes as it relates to syphilis. Benzathine penicillin G remains the recommended treatment. And just as an FYI, um, there actually is an ongoing randomized controlled trial kind of looking at early syphilis just to confirm and, and um, do in a trial um, to, de to determine whether one versus three doses of benzathine penicillin really are similarly or adequate um, treatment for early syphilis. Uh, in terms of um, inadequate serologic response after treatment, we know that many patients, particularly um, uh, those who are, who are diagnosed with later stage have a low initial RPR or of older age, they may not have that fourfold decline. Um, we also know that it may take some time for titers decline. And so CDC now has kind of um, increased the time period when we can follow people's titers and follow up. And so previously we would say you wanna follow people six to 12 months after primary and secondary to look for that fourfold decline. And now the CDC says you can wait out to 12 months. It often is a longer amount of time. Same for latent infection. It previously said 12 to 24 months, and now the guidelines say you can wait out to 24 months because it can take that amount of time for titers to drop fourfold. This slide just reviews um, treatment and how uh, syphilis staging influences treatment. I'm not gonna go through all the details on this slide. This is not really an update in the guidelines, but just kind of graphically represents how People who get staged with early disease, it's one dose of benzathine penicillin, but people who get staged with late disease, it's three doses of benzathine penicillin given at one week intervals. What is new on this slide is the recommendation during pregnancy. And so if you have somebody who is staged as late latent and they're receiving three doses of benzathine penicillin at one week intervals, um, in a, in a non-pregnant patient, ideally, um, it can be 10 to 14 days. Ideally, you want seven days, but in a non-pregnant pa patient, you can go out to 10 to 14 days. In a pregnant patient, uh, what is new is the guidelines, guidelines now say seven days is ideal as the interval between those doses, but you can go out to nine days and that's new in 2021. So you have a little bit of flexibility um, when you're giving those three doses to treat uh, late latent disease in a pregnant uh, woman. Um, if the person doesn't come back, and it's been 10 days and it's during a pregnancy, then you have to restart that whole series. Okay, a couple other updates highlighted in yellow here are related to ocular and otosyphilis. I mentioned I was gonna talk about these in more detail. And so uh, as it relates to ocular symptoms and the need to have a lumbar puncture. So patients, if they have ocular symptoms, these, um, these can often be changes in vision, um, it can be conjunctivitis, it can be seeing floaters, um, uh, and uh, previously the recommendation was anyone who had ocular symptoms and had a diagnosis of syphilis was that they needed a lumbar puncture as well as being seen by an ophthalmologist. Um, but now the guidelines basically say, as long as this person doesn't have any cranial nerve abnormalities or other evidence of neurologic involvement, um, you don't need to do a lumbar puncture. And that's because the sensitivity of a lumbar puncture for ocular syphilis is very, very low. Oftentimes you're gonna get a negative CSF and the, and the recommendation is still to treat for op, ocular syphilis. And so the same is true for otosyphilis. Uh, so if someone presents with tinnitus, loss of hearing, and they're being diagnosed with syphilis, if they only have these isolated auditory abnormalities and they don't have any cranial nerve abnormalities, the CSF is likely to be normal and it's not gonna change your management. And so you don't need to obtain an LP before treatment. You're gonna treat them for neurosyphilis, but there's no need to follow um, CSF. Then the final update as it relates to neurosyphilis um, is an addi additionally a change as it relates to CSF. And so there is some good data now that demonstrates that uh, normalization or drop in the RPR after treatment for neurosyphilis actually um, predicts the normalization of the CSF. And so it used to say that we used to, the recommendation previously was, you get a CSF to make your diagnosis of neurosyphilis. And then six months later, you would wanna get a repeat CSF to make sure that those abnormalities had cleared. And now the 2021 guidelines say, you don't need to get that repeat CSF because if, they're, if they do have a fourfold drop in their titer, um, we can be guaranteed that they have cleared the infection in their, C in, their C um, in the CSF. And so this is true for HIV uninfected persons as well as HIV infected persons who are on antiretroviral therapy. And that's because that's where we have the data in those two populations. 
Okay, moving on in syphilis, let's talk about syphilis in pregnancy. I mentioned when I was doing the, the screening section that I had a whole slide on this. And these are kind of updates highlighted in yellow related to, to screening in pregnancy. So we always wanna screen in pregnancy um, for syphilis. You wanna screen for syphilis in pregnancy at that first prenatal visit. You wanna screen at 28 weeks and at delivery. Um, if your patient has any of these specific risk factors, and these have been more detailed in the 2021 treatment guidelines. Uh, so if your, uh, your patient has multiple partners, drug use, an STI, like a gonorrhea or chlamydia during pregnancy, a new partner during pregnancy, or a partner with an STI during pregnancy, these would be linked to higher risk for uh, reinfection with syphilis during that pregnancy. Um, and the other indication for screening at 28 weeks and at delivery uh, would be if the person lives in a community with high prevalence of syphilis. The final update related to syphilis in pregnancy has to do with follow-up. And the most important point is down at the bottom of the slide, which is that, um, as, I, as I said earlier, it can take 12 months for titers to drop fourfold in early syphilis and up to 24 months for titers to drop um, in uh, late latent syphilis. And so we know pregnancy is only nine months. So most patients will not achieve a fourfold decrease in titers before they deliver. And so in terms of follow-up, we don't want to get monthly titers in these patients. Uh, a woman who's been diagnosed with syphilis in her pregnancy, uh, if she's diagnosed and treated at or before 24 weeks, you want to get a repeat RPR eight weeks after treatment, unless there's any concerns for a relapse with signs of, of primary or secondary. And then someone who's diagnosed and treated, treated and they're more than 24 weeks gestation, you just wanna repeat that serology at delivery. And so we don't wanna do monthly serologies in pregnancy in patients who've been treated for syphilis. Okay, I'm gonna shift and talk about herpes very, very briefly. Uh, and so um, the guidelines um, at the bottom, I, there's been no changes in treatment for herpes. So similar to syphilis, no changes in treatment. Uh, there's a little bit more detail that um, the type specific herpes PCR is the preferred diagnostic if the person presents with genital lesions, culture is less sensitive. Um, and then there's a bit of detail on the guidelines on serology. And I, I understand that you may not have access to serology in many of the islands, um, but just so that you're aware, that there are type specific serologic tests for, for herpes, um, but these have poor specificity. And so you have, you risk false positives, um, particularly at low index values. Um, and so there's only specific scenarios where you'd wanna utilize this serology. Um, and that's what this slide reviews. I'm not gonna go through the details on that. Um, I don't believe most places are using serology to make a diagnosis of herpes um, where you guys are located, but just to, to see that you're aware. And now I'm gonna shift and talk a bit about vaginal discharge. And we're gonna start with kind of a case scenario. Um, this isn't a polling one, but just to kind of start with a case. Uh, so we see um, a young woman, she's 40 years old. She comes in complaining of having vaginal itching and she has a malodorous discharge, a little bit of dysuria. And she's not certain if her partner is monogamous. She thinks that maybe he has some other partners. And on exam, this is what you see in this photo here as she has kind of a yellow frothy discharge and you're able to do microscopy um, on her. And um, actually, you're, so you, you do a pH test of this discharge and it's elevated, it's five. Um, and you do a whiff test and you get that nice fishy odor. And so she's got a positive whiff test. Her cervix looks okay. She doesn't have any cervical motion tenderness on exam, but your wet mount shows lots of WBCs, more than five for high power, high power field. You don't see any evidence of, of BV, you know, clue cells. You actually don't see any trichomonads. And there's no evidence of fungal elements, so no evidence of yeast. So what might be going on in this patient? And this is really just to highlight kind of the limitations of a wet mount for making a diagnosis of trick. And that's what's highlighted in red is that the sensitivity of a wet mount is about 50-50. It's like a coin flip. Um, it's very good. It's 100% specific. If you see those trick, you love seeing those trick on those wet mounts, um, you can make a diagnosis of trick. If you don't see them, it still might be trick. And so you have to really be thinking about this. And so if you have access to NAT tests, so there are um, a bunch of NAT tests that have been FDA approved to make a diagnosis of trick. that's fabulous. But if you're, your only test that you have is wet mount, you need to realize that the sensitivity is pretty low. Uh, and so the guidelines actually go through some updates in terms of testing. Um, I'm gonna start kind of at the bottom of this slide just to say that there have been some FDA cleared NATs and rapid tests for TRIC. Um, and uh, these tests are at the urine, the urethral, endocervical, and vaginal. Those are for women. And some of the urine and urethral have been approved for men, but not all of them. Um, 
But in addition, in the guidelines, um, there has been updated recommendations around screening. And so which, which patients do you want to screen for TRIC? We want to screen all persons, uh, all women living with HIV, and you want to screen them when they're entering care for HIV, and then at least annually. I mentioned earlier how correctional settings is a setting when you might have higher uh, prevalence of um, TRIC. And so that's a setting where you want to definitely want to screen women for TRIC. Um, screening for men is not routinely recommended. We know that um, TRIC is rare in men who exclusively have male partners. Um, we also know that extragenital TRIC is very rare. And so there's no uh, ever uh, a recommendation to do rectal or oral testing. What is new related to TRIC, um, there's been a treatment update. And so this slide kind of uh, reviews some data that was released in 2018. <coughs> uh, so for many years, the recommendation was for women being treated for TRIC uh, was the, the one dose, single dose of metronidazole. Um, but a study was released in 2018 by Patricia Kissinger, where she compared 623 women and they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either get the single dose of metronidazole versus the seven day. And this graph here on the right shows you what the outcomes were in this trial. Um, and they looked at follow-up cure. So at the seven day treatment, which is highlighted in the lighter blue, uh, a higher cure rate, it was, it was almost 90%, it was 89%. The single dose treatment was only 81%. And this was statistically significantly different. Uh, and so what is new now in 2021 is that all women, persons who are infected with HIV, persons who are HIV uninfected, um, if they're being treated for vaginal trick, uh, they need this longer duration of treatment. It has better efficacy and a higher cure rate. Um, and so metronidazole 500 twice a day for seven days is what should be used uh, to treat trick. Um, the recommended regimen for men who have trichomoniasis um, or for male partners of these women uh, would be just the stat dose of metronidazole. And that's because there have been no studies uh, in men who have trick with this longer duration of treatment. And this is just to let you know that the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology similarly has a similar recommendation. So they actually updated in 2020 to say that the best treatment for vaginal trick is metronidazole 500 twice a day for seven days. The other update in the guidelines relates to trick and its use with alcohol. Uh, and so, you know, there has always been this recommendation to refrain from alcohol when giving um, somebody metronidazole because there was a concern that metronidazole was similar to um, disulfiram um, in that it might uh, cause um, flushing and other kind of bad reactions uh, when they were combined together. Um, but actually a review that was done um, by a Norwegian group uh, they did a whole review of the, of the evidence and they found no in vitro or clinical studies, no animal models and no adverse event reporting. And they demonstrated that metronidazole actually does not inhibit this enzyme uh, that impacts alcohol metabolism. <clears throat> so it's not similar to disulfiram. Uh, and so you can have your wine <laughs> and take your flagell. Uh, you don't have to refrain from alcohol during treatment for BV or for TRIC or for other reasons that you might take metronidazole. So that's an update. All right, moving on to other, um, uh, other vaginal infections. Uh, just to give you a couple updates related to BV. Uh, so what's new in the 2021 treatment guidelines is that there's some new FDA cleared diagnostics for BV that have very good sensitivity and specificity. Um, but I wanna highlight um, that older methods um, still are useful. And so wet mount is great for making a diagnosis of BV. This picture up in the upper right-hand corner is uh, demonstrating some clue cells. These are evidence of BV. Uh, so these cells look like they've been dipped in sand and that's what you might see in somebody um, who has BV. And so the AMSL criteria, um, uh, you wanna get three out of four of these uh, criteria and you can make a diagnosis of BV. So someone who has an elevated pH, someone who has more than 20% clue cells on, on microscopy, somebody who has a positive whiff test and a homogenous thin discharge. If they've got three out of the four, uh, you can make a diagnosis of BV. In terms of BV, uh, there have been no treatment updates. And you'll just take a note here that the current recommended treatment for TRIC uh, is 500 milligrams twice a day for seven days. That is the same regimen that we can use to treat BV. So you can uh, use one regimen to treat two um, STIs. And so the treatment for BV is now the same as the treatment for TRIC, which is kind of useful. Um, there have been some updates as it relates to BV in terms of alternatives. Um, I'll just mention these highlighted in yellow. 
Secnitazole, which is fairly expensive. So I don't know how uh, well utilized it will be. Uh, it's a new alternative regimen. And there's two new topical uh, gels and a vaginal cream that are also have been added to the list of possible regimens to treat BV. Finally, I'll end uh, the vaginal section uh, on vulvovaginal candidiasis. Um, the updates in the guidelines, uh, there's an update that PCR testing is something that's going to kind of be in the pipeline. Uh, none of the PCR tests that are available for yeast are FDA cleared. They're kind of being used in research settings. Culture is the standard diagnostic, but wet mount is also good for, good for diagnosing uh, candidiasis. The main update um, in this uh, section is that there is more and more data that demonstrate that fluconazole should not be used in pregnancy. So there's been data in studies that demonstrate uh, with the use of fluconazole, there's an increased risk of congenital anomalies and spontaneous abortions. So you want to use some of the topical azoles uh, to treat uh, candidiasis in, in, in women. Okay, I'm going to be passing off now to Dr. Johnson, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you so much. Just give me a second, just like before, this is our last slide transition. I'm escape for a second, sorry. Give me just a second. Great. Okay. I think my slides look how I want them to look now. Sharon, can you guys hear me okay? Can you confirm? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. Okay. So I'll be talking about HPV next. And there's really a lot of information about HPV or human papillomavirus. It is a very common, most common worldwide STI. It is something that there is now a vaccine for, recommended for adolescents with catch-up vaccine for older people. And then what I'm going to be focusing on today is the sections on cervical cancer, on anogenital warts, and on anal cancer. So for cervical cancer screening, the bottom line is that you want to start a little bit later than, they, than, than maybe used to be recommended in the past. And also that there's some differences by professional societies and organizations regarding when they recommend starting screening with pap smears. So for USPSTF, which is United States Prevention Services Task Force, and for ACOG, which you heard about earlier, which is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, they recommend starting pap smears at age 21. Why don't they recommend it for younger people anymore? That is based on the fact that there's a low incidence of cervical cancer, and so there's now limited usefulness of screening for cervical cancer among adolescents. And then in 2020, the American Cancer Society actually started recommending waiting on pap smears until patients are 25 years old and sending that pap smear with HPV co-testing. And again, they said the reason to wait is that the incidence of invasive cervical cancer in women under 25 or people with a cervix under 25 is actually now decreasing happily due to the initiation of HPV vaccine programs. Where it's different is that adolescents with HIV infection who are sexually active should have cervical screening cytology sort of in accordance with HIV and AIDS guidelines, which we won't be going into today, but just know that that population might be a little bit different. Okay, and then when to sort of continue, how, how, what are the intervals at which you want to continue your screening for, for cervical cancer after you've started? So these recommendations that I'm going to talk about, they apply to persons with a cervix who are at average risk for cervical cancer. So what the USPSTF recommends between age 21 and 29 is that you do that pap smear and you get your cytology every three years. After that, from ages 30 to 65, you have different options. The USPSTF recommends continuing with PAP every three years. The American Cancer Society recommends actually an HPV test alone every five years, whereas finally ACOG recommends cytology plus HPV testing every five years. So just to know you have some options there, and there's some nice tables that sort of lay this out in the treatment guidelines. 
Also, just to know, this again is screening recommendations only for patients at average risk of cervical cancer. So if you have patients that fall into increased risk categories, and that's this list down here, but like patients with prior cervical cancer, a high grade precancerous lesion, they've had prior abnormal results, they're or they're immunocompromised, or they received this, um, their mothers received this chemical called diethyl stilbestrol in utero that's associated with cervical cancer. Um, so all of those people are on sort of a different screening program and, and just know that situation might be different if you're seeing patients with those conditions and situations. External anogenital warts also caused by HPV. And there are recommendations in the 2021 treatment guidelines about how to treat them. So there's patient applied therapies and provider administered therapies. On the patient side, you have options of topical imiquimod cream, topical pedophilix, which is a solution or gel, or you can use an ointment of cinecatechins. And there are sort of footnotes here that you'll see some of these options weaken condoms and vaginal diaphragms. Um, and all of them actually should just be used for external warts and might not be used for things like urethral meatal warts or the vagina or cervix or the anal canal. This is all spelled out within the guidelines. And I just want you to kind of have an overview here of, of what your options are. And when you're thinking about a regimen for your patients, think about pregnancy, think about immunocompromise, think about co-infection co with HSV, because all of those factors might play a role as well in your selection. On the provider side, the options are to treat with cryotherapy using liquid nitrogen or a cryoprobe. You could pursue surgical removal, or you can use trichloroacetic acid or bichloroacetic acid at 80 to 90%. And those are applied um, every one or two weeks topically. And again, some of them shouldn't be used on the urethral meatus. And, and all that to say, I'm not expecting you'll memorize this just based on this slide, but that these guidelines do exist and that if you're looking for them, they are in the 2021 STI treatment guidelines. Okay, now we're going to spend some time on viral hepatitis. First off, I wanna say that both hepatitis B and hepatitis A are vaccine preventable illnesses. So hep B and hep A vaccination is now recommended for all adolescents and young adults who have not previously received the vaccine series during childhood. And as I'm saying this, I am realizing one thing, which is I want to go back to HPV. I think I rushed through a slide and it's an important one. So I want to go back. So apologize. I'm going to shift back and we're going to finish up HPV. We talked about external anogenital warts and what your treatment options are. But one thing to know is that people who have those external or perianal warts, they might also have intraanal warts. So you might want to think about doing an anal canal inspection, rather whether, whether that's by digital exam or standard anoscopy or high res anoscopy, just something to think about. And then Dr. Adler mentioned this as well, but this is a change in the 2021 version of the guidelines for men who have sex with men. The guidelines are now recommending a digital anorectal exam to look for anal cancer. They're not formally right now recommending an anal pap with anal cytology. They're just recommending an exam. So I wanted to highlight that because it's new and it's different. I just wanted to say it again, just so you've heard it. Okay, now for real, back to hepatitis. So we talked about the fact that hep B and hep A are vaccine preventable. So those vaccines are recommended if you have a young adult or an adolescent who wasn't vaccinated previously. Now we're going to talk about each of the hepatitides in a little bit more detail. So for hepatitis A, there were actually no changes in the 2021 guidelines. So I'm gonna just share some information about hepatitis A, but, but it's not new. So diagnostically, hepatitis A is not the hardest to diagnose. It does require serologic testing. The main thing to know is that it's the hepatitis A IgM antibody that's diagnostic of an acute infection. If you get a total hepatitis A antibody, that includes uh, the IgG antibody, and that indicates the person is immune to hepatitis A, which is great, but it doesn't tell you whether that is because they had an infection or they had the vaccine. So just to know a little bit about hepatitis A testing, and main point to emphasize is that hepatitis A IgM is the acute hepatitis diagnostic test. 
Treatment-wise, most people do well. Acute hepatitis A infection usually only requires supportive care and doesn't require any specific restrictions on diet or activity. And some patients, unfortunately, do require hospitalization, but the things you would look for to, to indicate the patient should go to the hospital would be like dehydration from nausea or vomiting, or if they're developing signs or symptoms of acute liver failure, like abdominal pain or significant swelling or jaundice, et cetera. Now, for hepatitis B, hepatitis B is probably the most challenging of the hepatitis diagnostically. The diagnosis of hepatitis B is based on serology, and there's a combination of different serologic tests that you can send, and that includes the surface antigen, the surface antibody, and the core antibody. And for the core antibody, just to add another layer, there's actually an IgG and an IgM. And sometimes, again, you really need that core IgM to make an acute hep B diagnosis. The combination of serologies dictates whether you have an acute or chronic infection or whether you're immune to hepatitis B based on prior vaccination or a natural infection. And we won't have time to fully dive into all these different possible combinations today, but I just wanted to let you know that there are tables like the one on this slide that might make it easier to help you interpret the results of hepatitis B tests that you might be seeing. In terms of treatment, Acute hepatitis B does not require specific treatment and it's just managed supportively, just like acute hep A. However, unlike hep A, there is a thing like chronic hep B where it sticks around in the body and it can sometimes require treatment. Whether a patient with, hep, with chronic hep B needs treatment kind of depends on the patient's liver function tests, their hepatitis B viral load, and a few other factors. So basically, if you have a patient who you think has chronic hepatitis B and you think they might need treatment, you're usually gonna involve a specialist, and often that's gastroenterology or infectious diseases, if you're not sure whether the patient needs treatment. So for hepatitis B screening, and, and Dr. Adler touched on some of this, but I'll just review. For cisgender women and men, people at increased risk should be screened for hepatitis B. And the risk categories include the things listed at the top of this slide. So things like more than one sex partner in the last six months, being evaluated or treated for another STI, having past or current injection drug use, or having especially a partner who's known to be hepatitis B surface antigen positive. Or of course, if the patient's been exposed percutaneously, like through a needle stick to hepatitis B. So that's cisgender women and men, mostly risk-based screening. Pregnant people, you want to test the hepatitis B surface antigen at the first prenatal visit, regardless of any prior testing. And then again at delivery, if the patient falls into any of those risk categories that we discussed. Now for MSM and persons with HIV, they should be screened for hepatitis B using a surface antigen, a core antibody, and a hepatitis B surface antibody. Technically, that latter test, the surface antibody, is listed as optional in people with HIV, but going slightly outside of the guidelines, I personally recommend just sending it and then offering the hepatitis B vaccine if you're seeing HIV patients who are not hepatitis B immune, meaning they don't have a surface antibody and they don't have acute or chronic infection. Okay, so that's hepatitis B. And finally, hepatitis C. A little bit controversial whether you can get hepatitis C through sex. There's some data that between heterosexual couples and men who have sex with men, there have been some mixed results, with some studies showing either no or minimally increased rates of infection among partners of people who have H uh, HCV compared with those who don't have HCV. But there's also some data that indicate that sexual transmission of, of hepatitis C is possible, especially among people with HIV. So we've included it here in this talk. For hepatitis C, thankfully the diagnosis is easier. There's an antibody to hepatitis C that should ideally reflex to a hepatitis C RNA, which is a nucleic amplification test looking for a viral load for hepatitis C. One thing to just know is that the antibody to hepatitis C, it stays positive forever, either after a person has hepatitis C and clears it themselves or they get treated for hepatitis C. So if you have a patient who you know had hep C in the past, you don't need to get an antibody anymore. It's going to be positive. You can just use the hepatitis C RNA or viral load to look for reinfection. Now, for hepatitis C, 
there are treatment options. So if your patient has hepatitis C and they don't clear it on their own with their own immune system, their hepatitis C is a curable disease. So you can consult existing guidelines. You can see a website there that has those guidelines. You might need to involve a hepatitis specialist. Um, you do wanna test these patients for HIV and for hepatitis B as well. And then of course, if they don't have natural immunity and they've never been vaccinated to hepatitis A or B, they should be vaccinated for those diseases as well. It's not on this slide, but I also want to just say verbally that hepatitis C is curable, which is great, but it doesn't prevent reinfection. So if your patient is having ongoing situations that might expose them to hepatitis C, like especially injection drug use, maybe sex with multiple partners, those would be situations to keep sending HCV RNAs periodically just to make sure the person hasn't acquired a reinfection. So for hepatitis C screening, it's really gotten fairly easy. For cis women, cis men, and MSM, it's pretty much all the same all adults should be screened unless the, you're in a setting where the hepatitis C infection rate is really low. I wouldn't worry about that too much. Most of us live in high prevalence, high enough prevalence settings that you should just send it. So that's women, men, and MSM. Pregnant women, just like hepatitis B, you want to screen for hepatitis C in each pregnancy, even if they've been tested and negative before. And then people with HIV, they're a little bit different. You screen them at care initiation. And then for MSM with HIV, they're recommended to be screened annually. I personally, again, not in the guidelines, but I personally also screen people with HIV who are using drugs um, annually for hepatitis C, because I think that they are at risk. So we've sort of covered most of the content or actually all of the content that we were hoping to cover. So uh, I think we'll open it up for a question and answer session and, and we have plenty of time for that. So um, Sharon, do you wanna MC the question and answer section? Sure, I'm happy to MC that. Um, and we have a couple acknowledgements mm -hmm. uh, to Laura Bachman, uh, uh, Dr. Sancta St. Cyr, uh, Dr. Will Geisler, Dr. Ina Park and Dr. Christine Johnston because we utilize some of their slides. So we wanna just thank them. And then if you just go to the final slide, it's just the, any questions? And everyone who is on this call, I believe you can now unmute and we can take questions. Via audio. Are there any questions out there? It's your morning time. Everyone should be awake. <laughs> Anyone having a question, you can put it into the chat um, or feel free to unmute yourself. Hello, this is Roxanne and I wanted to say thank you very much to Dr. Adler and Dr. Johnson for this outstanding uh, presentation. It was very well done and very uh, organized. So we wanna thank you so much. Um, for um, this webinar. While our colleagues in the jurisdiction start to formulate their questions, I'll start with one. And I guess that was Dr. Johnson. Um, when you were talking about um, empirically treating for urethritis and cervicitis mm -hmm. and um, treating um, for the chlamydia, um, can you talk a little bit more about your the recommendations as far as um, what to do if you started treating empirically, but then find out that the chlamydia test was actually negative. Would you recommend continuing with the, the doxy regimen if it's come back before that uh, um, completed? Yeah, great. So the question is, you're treating for urethritis, you're using your doxycycline empirically, but then your test comes back and the patient actually does not have chlamydia. And I'm assuming they also don't have gonorrhea. Um, and, and Dr. Adler, of course, I welcome your thoughts on this too. But I think what I would do is optimally, if I know the person doesn't have gonorrhea or chlamydia, but they do have urethritis, my optimal would be to get them in for testing for mycoplasma genitalium because I would be concerned for that pathogen and maybe also trichomonas if they're a man who has sex with women. Um, ideally, I'd wanna test them for those alternative diagnoses. If I couldn't do that and I couldn't get them tested, what I personally would probably do is 
have them finish their doxycycline and then transition to another week of moxifloxacin so that I'm covering empirically for mycoplasma genitalium. That would be my personal approach, but I'd be happy to hear yours as well, Dr. Adler. I don't think I have anything to differ from what you just described. So. <laughs> cool, okay, Very great. thorough. Thanks. Thank um, you. I see that there's a question, um, kind of kind of a general question about recurrent complicated vulvovaginal vaginal candidiasis in someone who's got uncontrolled di diabetes after failure with topical azoles. And I would just say there really actually aren't many updates in the 2021 treatment guidelines, but we do welcome consultations at STDCCN on specific cases. And there are um, in the guidelines, in general, uh, you can treat with longer uh, regimens of fluconazole if you guys have access to fluconazole. And there's also details in the guidelines on some other topical regimens like boric acid. Um, but if there's a specific case, I can kind of go over the details for that specific case, but there's, there's nothing new in that arena. Um, but just know that you do have some options, longer, um, longer regimens of oral fluconazole or the um, boric acid uh, that can be used along with um, fluconazole as oral therapy, but they are very challenging. So kind of recurrent uh, vulvovaginitis can be very challenging. That's kind of a start from there. And it looks like Thora Mark raised their hand. Would you be able to unmute yourself and share your question? Yes, hi, this is Thora um, with the public health and Guam. So my question is for STD treatment. Um, in the past, well, we had the recommendation for a one-time treatment in the clinic. I know that has been updated to, you know, having, it, having the treatment for a few days. How do we manage a patient who is, let's say they're homeless, uh, unstable, and you're not sure if they would be able to keep up with that daily treatment, whether it's once a day, twice a day treatment. Do we revert to that one-time treatment in the clinic? Because we're not sure if, you know, having them, okay, come back daily and we treat you mm -hmm. and they cannot afford to purchase the medication. So what is your recommendation there? Yeah, I can take this one. I've, I've heard that concern a lot. And, and I'm assuming the question is probably about chlamydia and the change to the doxycycline for a week instead of the azithromycin, just one dose. Is that is that your question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I've definitely heard this this concern. And I think what most folks are saying is like, if you're super worried about adherence, and you just feel like it's going to be impossible for this patient to do the doxycycline, they're so disorganized, then I think I would I would personally lean on that alternative regimen and just give them the azithromycin times one and tell them to come back if their symptoms didn't get better. Happy to hear if you do something else as well, Dr. Adler. I, I would completely agree. I think that the guidelines give you that leeway that if you have someone where you're concerned about compliance and someone who is homeless and struggling with you know housing issues, um, maybe dealing with that, and so that the one-time dose um, would be you know something to utilize. Um, yeah. If it's a rectal infection, the data is really there that the doxycycline is better. So I I just have that discussion with your patient at minimum, you know, so that they kind of know that you're treating with an alternative regimen, which isn't wrong, but it may be less effective. So again, just have them come back and if their symptoms don't get better, especially. Or would you recommend, okay, go ahead and you give them the one-time treatment and then have them come back to retest for kill, to do the test of kill? No, unless they're pregnant, there's no recommendation for test of cure. So you wouldn't have to do that. It would mostly be just to tell them if your symptoms are not better, come back so we can reevaluate you and, and maybe reconsider your treatment options. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and make sure that they're aware that, you know, if they, they might be more compliant to doxycycline, knowing that um, the azithromycin is not the, the recommended regimen, but it's been moved to an alternative. But you have to work with each patient client individually and see what's going to be most appropriate for them. Um, and we want to get them treated. <laughs> so if they're not going to be uh, taking a medicine twice a day for seven days, then azithromycin is fine.
question in the yeah okay so there's a question um in the chat regarding retesting yes and so i kind of covered that but no no, no worries no apologies uh so re it's recommended uh retesting for both gonorrhea and chlamydia it's uh, ideally at three months um and that's for both women and men uh and in pregnant women uh, you want to retest um at three months it's for all patients who have been treated for gonorrhea and chlamydia the three month time period is the recommended interval um and then as i said you know that's ideal sometimes people may not come back for that three months they may come back at six months Months, that's great. Any any time in that one month to twelve months, those are the time periods when people are at higher risk for reinfection. So it's true in pregnant women, um, and it's true in non-pregnant women as well as in men. It's a routine recommendation for retesting. Thank you for that question, Anne. And let's and I see. I also see some stuff in the chat, just sharing what's available and not available to members of our audience. So this is from. Let me see. I'm going to go up a little bit. I see a comment that at this person's particular location, they only do gonorrhea and chlamydia in urine samples, so they don't have MGENT testing availability. Moxifloxacin and levofloxacin are not available. And they don't have hepatitis A vaccine as part of routine childhood immunization. And then I'm not sure what this means, but it, we still do VIA. And if you are the person that submitted that question and you want to clarify what VIA is, then we would be happy to have you come off mute. But if not, I mean, I think the, the challenge in that setting is going to be what do you do in cases of persistent urethritis? If you're gonorrhea and chlamydia, you send it and it's negative, but your patient's symptomatic, like what do you do? My guess would be that mycoplasma genitalium is the most likely pathogen. What I would do is treat with doxycycline for a week, followed by azithromycin, covering that sort of MGen regimen that, you know, it, it may not work, but it's probably your best, most available option. And then I do that, um, that test of cure for that patient to see if you actually cured it. And I, I would just add to that, you want to consider TRIC as well uh, in those recurrent urethritis patients. So if you have, um, you know, a male that's got only male partners, TRIC would be less likely. But if you have a male that's got female partners, you might consider doing TRIC as well. If you, unless, unless you've got testing for TRIC, um, which I'm not certain uh, whether you do at, at most of these locations. Looks like I agree with that. And then I see the <laughs> clarification, VIA is visual inspection with acetic acid. And I'm assuming that would be of the female genital tract there. I would say I don't do that routinely either in practice. Yeah, that's not something that's done, I think, in most settings in that I'm aware of SD clinics in the United in the States, in mainland. Are there any other additional questions? Thank you so much for those that have come in and thank you to those that have put in um, all the people that are listening at many at your location. So it seems like there's lots of people, lots more people than the numbers that we are getting in terms of participants. So that's great that you have multiple people listening in. That's wonderful. I actually have a question. May I ask my question? I'll direct it to you, Dr. Adler. It's about the recommendation in MSM for digital rectal exams. And we've been saying annual, and I think annual makes sense and is what I would do clinically. But when I was actually reading the HPV section in advance of this talk, I saw that they actually just recommend doing it, but then they say that there's insufficient data to recommend a particular age to start doing it or a particular interval at which you should do it. So I was curious if you had any additional insight into, you know, as as our slide decks were being made, whether we have some, you know, I know we have many experts contributing to these slides, like whether we should be doing this annually or if there's um, some other thing that you might know about this topic. You know, I actually don't know the interval um, for that. And that's interesting that you saw it. Sometimes what I found with the guidelines is there can be different content in different sections. Um, but I think I would suggest, you know, internally we can we could check with Dr. Park um, yeah, because great. she's very involved in HPV and the screening recommendations. And the other thing that's kind of in this arena that we should all be aware of is that there may be some changes as it relates to anal cytology based on the study that came out. Um, you know, so in the future, we may all be doing anal paps to detect anal cancer. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't have any, anything to add, but that's a great question. Yeah, we'll definitely ask Dr. Park. And then the study you're referring to, is that the anchor study? Yeah. 
Yeah, got it. Just for everyone, the anchor study was basically in HIV positive people who had high grade intra epithelial lesions of the anus, whether they should get treated or just monitored clinically by surveillance and treatment was actually effective at preventing cancer. So expect to see some changes there in, in guidelines coming up based on that, that anchor study. Um, so I see a question coming in related to treatment for syphilis, uh, but we have a history of penicillin allergy. Um, and so for um, it says for infants and children who need treatment for congenital syphilis, um, the recommended treatment for uh, children, for children, really the mainstay is benzathine penicillin. I don't think that any alternatives are listed. Um, I don't often treat, I mean, babies for sure, it's only benzathine penicillin. And I haven't heard of allergy in, you know, an infant. So that would be very unusual. And I would kind of want to know what the history of the allergy was. But for young people that may have a history of penicillin allergy, I would imagine the treatment would be, would be desensitization uh, because in young, young children who have, um, who have syphilis, really benzidine penicillin is the only adequate treatment. Let me just, I need to actually look that up because I don't do that much management of young kids. So we'll see if there's any other questions that come in and I will just confirm. Thank you for that. Unless you know the, the answer off the top of your head, Kelly. No, I am very much an adult infectious disease. Yeah, I mean, I don't take care of children, <laughs> but I I'm very much an adult as well. I, <laughs> I don't I believe do very much so. in children. You know, usually like if there is an alternative for syphilis, it's doxycycline. And I yes. think because of the tendon issues, like you wouldn't use doxycycline, yeah, so doxycycline in a developing child. Or, so. or and tetracycline are the typical alternatives in adult. I'm not aware that they're used in young children. And I'm just. Let me get to that. And then there's an uh, and let me just see if I can find a resolution to that question. Okay, while you look up that I can do the next one. It says what's okay. the benefit of doing non treponemal or treponemal test in the blood for ocular or otocyphilis. Yeah, so I think the benefit of that would be you're only going to get ocular or otocyphilis like if you have syphilis. So you have to make the syphilis diagnosis and so you would need the serology to diagnose syphilis and to stage the syphilis and then on top of that you would treat for ocular otic syphilis if that was the diagnosis and then i see another one as well if a pregnant woman has been diagnosed with chronic hepatitis b on her first pregnancy is it ideal to repeat a hepatitis b surface antigen again on the next pregnancy or is it recommended to just order a viral load that is a wonderful question. And I would say the screening guidelines really apply only to people who don't already have these conditions. If you have a patient who you know has chronic hepatitis B, you should probably already be in touch with either a gastroenterologist or an infectious diseases specialist to figure out if this patient should be treated for their hepatitis B. And then I would defer to their expertise about whether you need any repeat or new testing in the setting of pregnancy for this person. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And I have just a follow up. So it is, a, as I suspected, that uh, for young children, infants, or children, um, uh, you know, who are under, who are, who are being diagnosed with syphilis at a young age, it is benzathine penicillin or procaine penicillin. And so if they've got a penicillin allergy, and you do need to desensitize. There's no real alternatives that can be used in that age group. And so I just confirmed that in the guidelines. But uh, you're, we're kind of limited that both Dr. Johnson and myself mm -hmm. really primarily take care of adults and not young kids. But thank you for that question. And we'll just see if any more come in. For end. Doxycycline, should they be treated again with doxycycline? Since I did the MGen section, I can take that one. So I think it sort of depends on the timing. The idea of the doxycycline is to reduce the bacterial load. So it doesn't really treat the infection. It just sort of like knocks down the bacteria. So then you bring in a second drug to really kill it off and get rid of it. So I think if your patient got treated with doxycycline and it's been one day or two days, maybe you could, if you diagnose mycoplasma genitalium, you could go ahead and start your next step in therapy, probably moxifloxacin, maybe azithromycin. But if it's been like three weeks, four weeks, two months, then I would start all over and do the doxycycline for one week, followed by a second drug for another week. And I would concur with you because the doxycycline is used to reduce the bacterial load, but it's been months, then, 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 then uh, it's not going to be as if it's effective as sequential therapy. So yeah, I would agree. 
And so there's a comment on one of the slides showed decreasing resistance of gonorrhea fixing. That's good news, right? That probably was in your slide set. Probably was, and I um, see if I can get back to that slide, but it's gonna take me a minute. Yeah, I mean, the good news in general is that it looks like we're, our cephalosporins are still lasting and that uh, the increased resistance that we're seeing with gonorrhea really has to do with azithromycin and that probably was in your slide set and that was the data from the GISP. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. one more. So this was sort of like the big picture. Let's just see if suffixium specifically is on here. Not on that slide, maybe the next one. So yeah, I think I think that's fair. There has been like a slight decrease in suffixium resistance according to this slide. I would point out what the numbers are though on that y-axis. You're really talking about changes from like 1.5% to maybe 0.5%, you know? So it's not like huge percentages of isolates that were having difficulty with suffixium um, susceptibility in the first place, which yes, that is good news. And we have to be careful because what we've seen with gonorrhea over many years with many different antibiotics is that it really does develop resistance pretty easily. So, you know, I think it's good news for now and something for us to definitely keep an eye on in the future. Okay, I think this one's for you, okay. Dr. Adler. Yeah, so there's a question about, about the diagnosis of trip, trick on a PAP. Um, so you, yeah, you can use, um, for diagnostics for trick, you can use wet mount, you can use some of these nets, uh, and some of the, um, the you can use a PAP as well. Um, a, a urinalysis, um, the utility of a urinalysis for diagnosing trick would be very, very low. <laughs> so I th think that would be like spun urine sediment or looking at just a urinalysis on, you know, on a, uh, under a microscope and the, the sensitivity is going to be probably very, very low. Um, so, you know, sometimes you might see trick in a male patient under a spun urine sediment. Um, if you do, that's great, but I don't know the specifics, uh, the specific sensitivity off the top of my head, but I imagine it's pretty low. Um, so, you know, if you see it, yes, you can make your diagnosis, um, but I, I think it's probably lower than wet mount um, for both for the urinalysis. So I think in the, in the region of trick, you have to realize that sometimes you have to treat if someone presents, uh, you've kind of have to treat syndromically. So if someone presents with this classic discharge and you've kind of ruled out BV, you don't see any manifestations of B, you do your AMSOS criteria and all those criteria are negative for BV. You don't see evidence of yeast, um, but you do see you know, a frothy discharge and symptomatic patient, then you're probably gonna treat um, knowing, unless you can send off a gnat or send off a culture, if you don't have access to those. Um, I think if you've done a wet mount, there'd be no utility in doing a UA. If you're treating a man, um, that would be one method that you could be able to be able to use to make a diagnosis, but I think it's, it's lower sensitivity than even a wet mount. Um, but if you can do it, you know, and you find it, then you make, then the specificity is about hundred percent. So, um, you know, it's worth the effort if it's there, if it's not there, it's probably less than a coin flip, um, in a male patient. But of course, and, if you're getting urine or you're getting a vaginal swab, or you're getting a cervical swab from your exam, the nucleic amplification testing is really the, the best test we've got right now. So if you have access to that, I would add, yeah. that would be great. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think it's accessible in most of the islands. That's my understanding, yeah. so yeah. yeah. Bummer. Thank you, Roxanne, for that question though. Oh, can we talk more about the sixth P in history? So <laughs> um, that is something that we actually add in at the prevention training centers. It's not part of the 2021 treatment guidelines, but it's just kind of to recognize that um, we want to ask, you know, maybe there could be um, some issues that we might be concerned about related to um, anatomic issues that may be causing pleasure or displeasure. Maybe there's uh, concerns about intimate partner violence that is uh, that is that uh, that might come up when we're asking about pleasure. Maybe there's functional issues that might come up when we're asking about um, pleasure. And so that's just sort of a um, if you're having a conversation with a patient about their sexual history and inquiring about um, their behaviors that inquiring beyond just the five Ps and to kind of ask about uh, things that might lead you uh, toward um, understanding more of any um, 
physiologic issues, um, any, any um, functional issues, um, or any issues that might make you concerned about intimate partner violence, which is things to consider. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Kelly, you might. Not so much. I would agree that it's a bit aspirational, even for me right now. And I see a lot of patients with HIV and STIs, and I find with the exception of like older male patients starting to struggle with sexual functioning where it comes up, I would say I'm not great about asking patients if their sex lives are satisfying for them. If the, you know, often we ask about like, are you being abused? Are you being hurt? And, and those are questions I tend to ask, but I think I too could do a better job of just opening that dialogue. If there's anything else about sex lives that patients want to talk to a doctor about. And yeah. I, I actually like that wording. Um, uh, is there anything else that you want to, might want to share with me about your uh, sexual life and sexual behaviors? That's kind of a nice open-ended way to ask that question uh, that includes, you know, pleasure, but is more broad. Um, so that might be a nice way to ask that. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. I like it too. Um, then there's a question. Okay. I think I use this terminology, so I'll clarify. Can you briefly explain what you mean by cis and trans women for the benefits of non-STI staff here? Sure. Yes. No problem. And I apologize for using jargon. So cis man or cis woman basically means that patient was born a man like for exa example a cis man was born a man assigned male sex at birth and now they still identify as a man that is a cisgender person and they can be of any sexual orientation so a cisgender male can still be bisexual or they can be gay um, but the the gender refers to how they identify in terms of their gender like i'm a cisgender female i was assigned female sex at birth and i identify as a female now in terms of my gender then for trans women that would be defined by a person who was assigned male sex at birth but now identifies in terms of their gender as a woman i hope that clarifies things All right, we'll wait to see. Thank you for all these questions that have come in so far. We're oh, at about 547 or well, that would be uh, 1147 your time. Um, so we're, we welcome more questions if they if you have them. If not, maybe keep, well, just pull up the CME slide. Just want to make sure that we okay. get that up there. So we want to just remind folks about the process for getting CME, even though we, we welcome more questions if they come up. We'll just scroll to the very final Sorry. slide. I can't remember what slide number it's it is. The, it's so. the very, very end. Yeah, I know. I just can't remember the slide numbers. That's okay. So we're almost there. Just to remind everyone, um, if you want to get CME, these are the details about getting that. And it looks like attendance has been noted because if you put all the names in of everyone who was in your room with you, that's great. Uh, if you stay this long in the webinar, that would be included as being <laughs> watching the webinar live in full and that you have to uh, complete a post-course survey evaluation, which you're going to get uh, within the next week or so. <coughs> or so. Um, and then you have to complete this evaluation and note that the email is going to come from training at nnptc.org. And so that's just our CME reminder. Um, but let's see if there's any other questions that come up in chat, because both Dr. Johnson and myself are happy to answer any further questions. <coughs> So Roxanne or Trinita, any further questions from you guys that you can think of? Not for me, I, I asked um, a couple of questions that I thought might be of interest to the group. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, well, I think with that, I wanna thank everybody for attending this STI guidelines update. I really appreciate you all being involved and engaged and having these great questions. I know there was the one question about uh, vulval vaginal candidiasis that I wasn't so great at answering that one and that one because it's more of a case by case basis. But if there's a specific question that comes up, we can definitely answer that in the STDCCN. Um, and I hope that you all have a wonderful day. I wish I was on the islands, not here in Northern California in the cold. I know that it's nicer weather there than here right now. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you all. Aloha.